Hello, I'm Bob Trubshaw. I'd like to talk to you today about two 12th century fonts, one in Leicestershire and the other in Rutland. These two fonts each tell us a good story about Christian baptism. Or, more accurately, they told a good story to the people who saw them in the 12th century. Um, the narrative has been a bit lost in the subsequent centuries. And not only a bit lost, a bit confused. Um, you, you'd actually be f forgiven for thinking that this font in the church at Thorpe Arnold, which is just to the north of Melton Mowbray, is showing Archangel Michael fighting a dragon. A bit confusingly, not just one dragon. Instead, three dragons. Or maybe one polycephalic dragon with three heads. The protagonist seems to be heading for a score draw. Uh, well, that is, until you walk round the font and spot two more draconian blighters creeping up from behind. I think all bets are off for the outcome. Now, around the same time that this font was carved, a depiction that's undoubtedly of Archangel Michael and a dragon was carved on a tympanum at the church in Hallerton. Quite a big difference in style, and in the meaning. At Hallerton, the saint is dominant, and the dragon is, well, decidedly defunct. Unlike the Thorpe Arnold font, which clearly depicts an ongoing battle, we're not sure who's going to win. And it's a battle which will continue until the end of time. Well, until at least this font crumbles into dust. Bear in mind, this was never intended to be seen as bare stone. It would have been coloured with equally vigorous and vivid manner, uh, perhaps quite luridly to modern sensibilities. Thorpe Arnold makes much more sense when we bear in mind the words of the long-standing liturgy of baptism, which deems the baptised person to have become a soldier of Christ. The Latin liturgy, in use in the 12th century, uh, was translated into the vernacular at the Reformation in the 16th century. The relevant part of the Book of Common Prayer, the actual act of baptism by signing a cross with holy water, reads, We receive this person into the congregation of Christ's flock, and do sign him with the sign of the cross, in token that hereafter he shall not be ashamed to confess the faith of Christ crucified, and manfully to fight under his banner against sin, the world, and the devil and to continue as Christ's faithful soldier and servant until his life's end. Amen. The same idea is still present in the current Church of England common worship book, with the baptismal wording simplified to fight valiantly as a disciple of Christ against sin, the world and the devil. The phrase soldier of Christ is still used by the Church of England as part of the confirmation rites, with the words, as baptism makes us children of God, so confirmation makes us soldiers of Christ. Uh, this martial analogy also explains why in the 1860s there was a breakaway group of evangelical Methodists who took to wearing military uniforms and calling themselves the Salvation Army. So this soldier on Thorpe Arnold font is not a saint, still less an archangel, else he would have wings and most likely a halo or nimbus. It is instead a graphic depiction of the ideals a person who has been baptised would be expected to live up to. Yet, fending off assorted demons, one hopes more metaphorically than literally. And my thanks to Ivor Perry for this interpretation of Thorpe Arnold's font. And in case you're wondering, the dappling light on the soldier's face was a ray of sunshine coming through a stained glass window and the branches of a tree outside on a breezy day. I just happened to visit at the right time. It really shouldn't be any surprise that fonts depict aspects of the relevant liturgy. And with that very much in mind, let's look at this splendidly carved font at Greetham in Rutland. Square top, round base. Well, for a start, look at all those curved pleats making the transition from the round base to the square section of the upper font. Every pleat is carved with incredible precision, even though each one follows its own complex geometrical profile. Whoever carved this was a stonemason with consummate skills, and was seemingly prepared to risk all taking on this project, where there was little or no scope to, to correct any mistakes. Words like showing off don't even begin to do justice to the audacity and craftsmanship. I think few modern masons could produce such skilled work without mechanised machining, and I suspect the same was true among the contemporaries of this particular virtuoso artisan. 
The four heads are also well executed, three are human, while the fourth is more bestial. I note particularly the exaggerated proportions of the tong poker. This is a gesture of defiance all around the world. Just think of the all-black rugby team and their famous hacker. Four heads on Romanesque fonts are not that rare. But why are they there? Just to be decorative? Maybe. Or to act as an aid memoir to part of the liturgy? Mm, Sounds more promising. Easiest option would be to explain the heads on this font as devils being cast out by the rite of baptism. But, actually, if they were devils, you don't want them hanging about. This explanation simply doesn't work. Such heads are sometimes interpreted as representing the four directions, north, south, east and west. I've no idea why the four directions would be depicted on a font. Fonts aren't exactly weather vanes. Uh, and there's no liturgical reference to the cardinal points in the relevant literature. Um, a lady called Mary Curtis Webb, um, based on the work of Professor Harry Bobber, um, suggested that the four heads on the font from Hampstead Norris in Berkshire, um, it's now actually in the church at Stone in Buckinghamshire, depicts the four elements of air, fire, water and earth. But the heads on the Hampstead Norris font are not in the four corners, but instead form a fourfold knot pattern and this does indeed emulate a diagram in a 12th century manuscript clearly labelled in Latin as earth, air, fire and water. And the manuscript uh, interweaves the four elements with the four humours or temperaments of Hippocratic medicine. Uh, these are commonly known as black bile or melancholy, yellow bile or choleric, phlegm or phlegmatic and blood or sanguine. But where the heads are in the four corners of a font, as it greet them, then for once we do have a fairly reliable idea of what they were intended to denote. They were the four rivers of paradise. Now, the first impression might be this is as far-fetched as the four cardinal directions or the four humours. But it's not. The rite of purification for the water to be used in baptism is based on Genesis chapter 2, verse 10 which refers to the four rivers of paradise and names them as the Phison, the Gion, the Tigris and the Euphrates. More specifically, Genesis refers to the sources of these rivers, their headwaters. And in the Vulgate Latin of 12th century Bibles, the word for headwater of a river is capita. Think of the modern word decapitated from the Latin caput, which principally means head. And then the word play or just possibly some more misunderstanding, comes obvious. Once aware of the Vulgate Latin, this uh, pun seems reasonably obvious. Yet, without that insight into the biblical passage quoted in the relevant liturgy, it, well, yeah, it was anything but obvious. So I'm fairly confident that the Greetum heads depict, in a very symbolic manner, the headwaters of the four rivers of paradise invoked in the blessing of the baptismal water. And if that's so, then just maybe all those fancy pleats are a stylized depiction of flowing water. Although Mary Curtis Webb seemed not to be aware of the Greetum font, my understanding of Romanesque fonts was helped by her posthumously published book called Ideas and Images in Twelfth Century Sculpture. Um, ben Elliott kindly made available a copy of the printed version, uh, and more recently has been made available as a free PDF. I'll include the link below. And I'll also include a link to my own PDF, which goes into considerable detail about Romanesque and medieval carvings.